Thanks, Ben. Before I get started, there's a few people I'd like to thank for without them, this research wouldn't have been possible during 2013. Firstly, Julianne Hill from GRDC Regional Cropping Solutions Network for funding this research. Fiona Martin and Steve Curtin for managing the site at Nyabing. Sarah Hyde and the Facey Group for managing the site at Wickapen. And John Seabrook, Fiona Martin and Gary Lang for hosting the trial sites in 2013. So today I'm here to tell you that if you farm in a low-lying, frost-prone environment, we should all be burning our stubbles black. That's right, we need to get out those redheads and watch the landscape burn. We need to be implementing a torched earth policy. So we all know that stubble has a, an effect on, well, we all know that frost effects are worse, low in the landscape, and we all know that frost has a neg negative impact on yield. But today, I'm here to show you how stubble influences frost severity and how this can also have a negative impact on yield. What we've been hearing from farmers is that in areas low in the landscape where they'd been removing stubble, they were seeing less severe frosts. So in those low-lying, generally frosty areas where they were removing stubble through burning or cultivation, they were seeing less severe frost effects. So in 2012, the Living Farm Grower Group in York decided to test this hypothesis we were hearing from farmers, and we implemented a large-scale stubble trial. We found one of the most frosty paddocks in York, right on the banks of the Avon River, where we retained a section of two hectares of stubble. The remainder of the paddock was burnt. Following seeding, Temperature loggers were placed both on and off the stubble and recorded changes in canopy temperature at three minute intervals at a height of 600 millimetres. At the conclusion of the trial, a small plot research header was used to take header cuts to compare the yield from the, stubble, from the crop on the stubble and off the stubble. And then the farmer's broad scale harvester was used to create a yield map. What we found at the, in the research was that on average stubble treatments were one degree colder than the removed stubble treatments. The total time below zero degrees was nine, degre nine hours for the standing stubble treatment and eight hours for the removed stubble. And although this doesn't seem like much, this contributed to a massive yield difference of 0 0.39 tonnes per hectare on the standing stubble treatment and the 1.71 tonnes per hectare on the removed stubble treatment. Now, what we didn't realise was that the FACI group down at Wickapen were also conducting similar research to us in 2012, and their results mimicked ours. So here we've got the yield map from the York site conducted in 2012 on the banks of the Avon River. And you can see here the large square is the two hectare area of stubble that was retained for the duration of the trial and the rest of the paddock was burnt. The small squares are where the harvest cuts were taken using the small plot trial header, and that's where we got the yield difference of 0 0.39 versus 1.71 tonnes. And visually, through the coloration of the trial, you can see how much lower yielding the retained stubble plot was. So because of this fantastic research that we got in 2012 at both Wickapen and York, we were fortunate enough to obtain some GRDC Regional Cropping Solutions Network funding to continue this research in 2013, and also fortunate enough to obtain the assistance of Ben Bidoff to help us with our endeavour. So in 2013, the trials aimed to quantify the impact of stubble on the extent, severity and duration of frost, and how this has an effect on canopy temperature and grain yield. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I want to be able to show you how retaining stubble increases the severity of frost and how it also increases the duration of frost, leading to a decrease in crop yield. In 2013, the trials were conducted using large-scale replicated field trials at Nyabing, Wickapen and York, with two main treatments, those being standing and removed stubble. The removed stubble was either implemented through burning or raking, depending on stubble density at the trial. 
The decision was made to conduct large-scale trials as opposed to small plot research trials as we found in 2012 that there was quite a substantial edge effect with frost, it wasn't cut and dry, so we wanted to make sure there was large enough plots that were going to influence canopy temperature and pick up those differences that we were seeing. Once the crop was sown, we placed temperature loggers at in, within each plot along the slope of the trial. These were recording temperatures at three minute intervals at a height of 600 millimetres. Generally, temperature is recorded at a height of 1.2 metres using a Stevenson screen. However, there can be two degrees difference in temperature between a height at 1.2 and canopy height. That's why the decision was made to record temperature within the canopy. This is the trial layout for the York and Wickerpin sites in 2013. You can see that we have got the standing and removed treatments replicated across the landscape. Plots were approximately 200 metres in length, running down the natural slope of the trial, and plot widths were between 30 and 48 metres, depending on farmers' scale header widths. Now, at the Wickerpin site, the Facey Group farmers decided that they'd also like to see the influence of cultivation on the trial, so an additional plot was added on with a cultivated strip in this trial. The blue dots represent the location of temperature loggers, for the trial throughout the period. The York site was sown on the 20th of May to May sweet with a stubble density of approximately 2.2 tonnes per hectare and the Wickerpin site was sown on the 31st of May to a stubble density of approximately 4 tonnes per hectare. Now I'm going to show you some temperature results from these two sites in 2013 but due to time I'm just going to go through the temperature results relating to the data loggers at the lowest point in the landscape. So this is the graph showing the minimum temperatures recorded at the York site between August and October in 2013. Across the top, we've got the dates in which temperatures were recorded below zero degrees. Down the side, we've got minimum temperatures down to minus 2.5. The blue columns represent the standing stubble treatments and the red columns represent the removed stubble treatments. And on the far side here, we've got the average temperature recorded across these frost events. So there was 12 frost events at the York site between August and October, with all dates showing significant differences in stubble treatment between standing and removed stubble. Consistently, the standing stubble was colder than the removed stubble treatment. On average, across these 12 frost events, the standing stubble treatment had a temperature of minus 1.1 degrees and the removed stubble had a temperature of minus 0 0.6 degrees. So on average, across these 12 frost events, there was a difference in temperature of 0 0.5 degrees, which can be quite substantial in terms of frost. However, at the York site this year, we did not experience any frost damage or yield loss. This is most probably because the crop was flowering outside the time period when these frost events were occurring. So you can see that flowering was occurring between the 12th and 22nd of September and so it was fortunate enough to avoid the frosts. We found similar results at Weekerpen in 2013. So again we've got the dates that temperatures fell below zero degrees across the top temperatures down to two degrees across the bottom, across the side, sorry. Standing treatments were sown, shown in blue, removed stubble treatment is in red, and the cultivated strip that was added to this trial is shown in green. There was nine frost events at the Facey Group site during 2013. During the majority of these frost events, the cultivated treatment remained the warmest on all occasions. And on six of the nine frost events, the standing stubble treatment was significantly colder than the removed stubble treatment. On average, the standing stubble treatment had a temperature of minus 0 0.7 degrees. The removed stubble treatment was at minus 0 0.5. And across these nine events, the cultivated treatment actually stayed above zero degrees at 0 0.2 degrees Celsius. So if we were to extrapolate this data, 
we could assume that if the whole paddock had been cultivated, there would only have been four occasions between August and October when this site would have fallen below zero degrees. So now I've shown you that at Wickerpen and York, the stubble had a severe impact on temperature differences on, with frost and the stubble loading. Now I'm going to take you through the results from the niobing site. At niobing, it was conducted slightly differently. The niobing site was conducted on a canola stubble, which we weren't sure would actually have enough biomass there to give us substantial results. We were actually pleasantly surprised. This is the layout of the trial at niobing. As with the other trials, we've got standing and removed stubble replicated across the landscape, plots running for approximately 300 metres down the natural slope of the trial. The trial was conducted on a canola stubble following an 800 kilo canola crop, so there was not much stubble biomass to begin with. Because of this, we were not able to hold a fire across the removed stubble plots, so stubble was removed through raking. Again, because we were concerned that there wasn't going to be enough stubble at this site, out of interest, a 30 by 30 square metre plot was added at the lowest point in the landscape. Here, stubble that had been previously removed from the trial was placed back on to create a high stubble load. Again, temperature loggers were placed at this site and they're, they're shown again in blue. Here's a visual representation of the stubble loading at the Niobing site during the season. You can see that the raked or removed stubble plots had an approximate stubble loading of less than half a tonne per hectare. The standing stubble plots were 2.6 tonnes per hectare and the additional stubble plot, which was that 30 by 30 metre square that we implemented, had a stubble loading of 3.5 tonnes per hectare. Now I know that this graph's probably a little bit busier than the other two, but all I really want you to see is the trends that we're seeing between the three treatments. So again, across the top, we've got the temperatures in which canopy, dates in which canopy temperature fell below zero degrees. Down the side, we've got the minimum temperatures. And already you can see that the niobing site was substantially colder than York and Wickerpen, getting down to minus five on one occasion. And again, we've got the average temperature across these dates shown on the far side. The additional stubble plot, which was about 30 by 30 square that we added, is shown in green. Standing stubble is shown in blue and the removed stubble treatment is in red. There were 15 frost events at Niobing between September and October, many of which occurring during flowering and early grain fill. And throughout the trial period, on 14 of the 15 frost events, the additional stubble plot had significantly lower temperatures than the standing or removed stubble plot. There was also significant differences on some occasions between the standing and removed stubble plot. So this is mimicking the results that we were seeing at York and Wickerpen. On average, the additional stubble plot, that 30 by 30 square, had a temperature of minus 2.4 degrees. Standing stubble was at minus two degrees and the removed stubble was at minus 1.8. Now, we all know that a crop is more susceptible to frost at certain time periods. So generally, a crop is most susceptible between booting and early grain fill. And we can see this here, that once you overlay it with the temperature results from niobing, that all these frosts occurred right during when these, plant, these plants were flowering and trying to develop grain. So although it's thought that one frost event can heavily impact on a crop's yield, it's actually a multitude of frosts over consecutive days that can result in crop damage. So now I've shown that stubble treatments can increase the severity of frost but now we want to see, does it influence the length of time it stays below certain t temperatures? Here we've got a graph from the niobing site again at the lowest point in the landscape, looking at the cumulative hours the treatments are below different temperature thresholds. So along the base we've got the different temperature thresholds we were looking at from zero through to minus four degrees. And on this axis here we've got the cumulative hours below these temperature. So this is just a to the total number of hours these treatments were below 
those different temperature thresholds. Again, the additional stubble is highlighted in green, standing in blue, and removed stubble is shown in red. What you can see is that at minus one and minus two, the highest stubble load, the additional stubble plot, had significantly more time at minus one and minus two than the other two treatments in the trial. But once you get down to minus three and minus four, it doesn't matter what strategy you've tried to implement, everything's gonna get cold. So now we can also see that stubble has an effect on the duration, the length of time that it's below certain temperature thresholds. But then does this, does this then express itself in a decline in yield? This is an aerial photograph taken at the Nyaming site during November. In October, we conducted yield estimates at the site and we, we estimated the yield potential of this paddock to be four tonnes per hectare. Final yield of this paddock was two and a half tonnes and this can mainly be attributed to frost. And you can see the visual effects of frost in this picture. The dark area here is frost affected crop and you can see how the cold air has moved down the landscape and out through the base of our trial to the drainage point. Cold air has also moved through the middle of our trial and you can see here how it's affected that 30 by 30 square that we originally implemented. So the reason this crop has turned dark in coloration is usually a crop converts sugar to starch to form grain after flowering. However, the frost has aborted these flowers, so it's no longer able to conduct this process, resulting in the sugars remaining within the plant and bacteria are feeding off them, creating the darker coloration. So in October, we started to realise that there were some big differences showing up at this niobing frost site, and we were concerned that farmers, broadacre harvesters weren't going to pick these differences up in yield maps. So we decided to harvest the bottom 60 metres, so the worst frost affected area of the trial, using a small plot research header. The trial was divided up into a checkerboard pattern and small plot trials of approximately 1.8 by 5 metres were harvested. There was a total of 1,600 plots harvested to create this yield map that you can see here. And as with the visual aerial photo that we saw previously, you can see the additional stubble plot yielded much lower than the standing or removed stubble treatments. This also correlates, well this is also shown with further analysis of the yield results. Yield here is shown with the blue columns and you can see the significant differences in yield both low and high in the landscape. The additional stubble plot, so that 30 by 30 square, averaged 0.6 tonnes per hectare. The standing stubble treatment averaged one tonne per hectare, and the additional stubble plot averaged 1.8 tonne per hectare. Significant differences were also seen high in the landscape, where there was a 0.6 tonne difference between standing and removed stubble. Now we've got the harvest index as well, which is shown in the green columns, and harvest index is the ratio of grain to biomass in a crop. And the harvest index here has correlated with yield, where the lower the harvest index, the lower the yield. And you can see that as well with the additional stubble plot almost having a non-existent harvest index. Now when we overlay the um, frost-induced sterility to look at, frost-induced sterility is assessment of the number of grain that have been aborted within a wheat plant. So frost-induced sterility of the additional stubble plot was 87% in comparison to the other treatments which were down between 10 and 20%. And this has a negative correlation with yield, so obviously the higher the frost-induced sterility, the lower the yield. So we've shown that stubble has an incidence, has an effect on the severity and the duration of frost, and it also affects the yield of a crop. But how does it influence grain quality? These are some photos taken from grain samples collected after harvest um, from the three treatments. And just visually, you can see the difference in quality between the additional standing and removed treatments. The screenings for the additional stubble plot were 
substantially more than screenings found in the standing and removed stubble treatments. And the percentage of frosted grain within the treatments, 34% in the additional stubble plot and 14 and 16 in the standing and removed stubble treatments. So just to sum up, in 2013 we conducted three trials at Nibing, Wickerpen and York looking at the removal and retention of stubble and how this had an effect on the severity and duration of frost. We assessed canopy temperature and yield components to get these results. So just our take home messages from these trials. So we have found that stubble does increase the severity and duration of frost in low lying frost prone areas. Removing stubble has shown to reduce frost damage and reducing stubble in high frost prone areas can result in high yields, therefore lower economic loss. And we found that at the Niobing site in 2013 with yield differences between 0.6 and 1.8 tonnes per hectare. Thank you. Uh, Hamlin Jones, uh, University of Dundee. Um, do you have a, an explanation for the effect of stubble? We've, it's just in the preliminary stages at the moment, the research, but we hypothesise that it's, the stubble is acting like an insulation layer. So as a start, it's not allowing heat to penetrate the soil during the day. Um, so the burnt or remove stubble plots are allowing more heat to penetrate the soil and then it's dissipating more slowly during the night, providing the warm temperatures. Jeremy Lemon. Sorry, Rebecca, if you could just go back to that uh, aerial shot and you were, you were talking about cold air drainage across the, the landscape. <coughs> um, was there any sort of drainage that was going and seemed, or do you think it was either resting on that uh, high stubble load area or was it going past it and it was sort of got the impression that it was sort of lobbing there? Yeah, we're further, we've got further research being conducted this year to look at that, whether stubble orientation has an effect, so whether standing stubble or stubble that's been flattened and lying down does have an effect on this because it does visually looking at it feel like it's actually stopped the cold air from moving further. But regardless, the temperature results at York and Wickerpen are still showing that there is big temperature differences regardless of whether it's call, causing the air to stop. Are there any other soil or crop management options that can even further enhance what you're observing um, in relation to allowing a much greater heat to penetrate during the day uh, in order to help um, make this problem much less? Yeah, so um, both between DAFWA and Living Farm and quite a few other organisations in 2014, we've um, obtained a GRDC investment plan looking at frost and that's looking at a multitude of different um, management strategies, so these include stubble, plant growth regulators, uh, grazing management, nutrition, to look at exactly that. Are there other options other than removing stubble to influence canopy temperature? So yeah, the work will be continuing for the next two years. Based on your hypothesis, um, you'd expect different soil types to have an impact as well. Did you notice that with these trials? Um, the, we conducted soil tests across all three sites prior to seeding and in terms of soil composition there was no difference in these soil types across the trial sites but again for this further research that we've got coming up is looking at soil colour and soil composition and to their effects on stubble as well. Garen. Thanks Rebecca, great work. Uh, Garen Neal from Consult Ag. Just to clarify, clarify on a couple of points. One, the standing stubble, was that cut high or at a 30 centimetre height? Or you know, just trying to get a picture for how much was actually standing up. And the other one, the cultivated strip at Wiki, um, how was that just a rip up with a scarifier or multiple rips? Or, yep. And did you see a non wetting, a fixing non wetting with that cultivation? Did you observe that during the year? Yeah, okay, so the um, stubble was 
Start, the trials were harvested prior to us knowing that we were conducting the work, so they were just done at normal grower practice height. Uh, the York site was approximately 15 to 20 centimetres high, and Wickerpin was about the same. Um, Niabing was obviously much higher, being canola, but was, yeah, much lower density, so it didn't have as much of effect. The, in terms of the cultivating, I would have to ask the FACI group. I know it was just cultivated, like scarified once, but in terms of Ben, you might be able to shed some light as to whether there was any other effects of non-wetting or... Yeah, there's a lot of effects of the cultivation within that. Um, York, uh, the Wickerpin site yielded more, had more nitrogen. Gary didn't put enough nitrogen out, so um, there was a bit of mineralised nitrogen and also probably cleaned up a bit of rhizoctonia base levels under there as well. But I guess the interesting thing from that cultivation is even though that cultivated strip um, produced high yield, high biomass, high canopy closure, it still was warmer. And so certainly an area that kind of goes against what we have been looking at in terms of knowing that, if, you know, if you set a crop up for frost, the easiest way to do that is to build a big thick canopy. Well, essentially we did that within that cultivation treatment, but we didn't get, we were actually warmer, not colder.